All right, so today I'm presenting to you the Creality K1C. Uh, let's look at this picture. It looks pretty much the same as the Creality K1. So I guess most of the differences are gonna be under the hood. So let's get this unboxed, take a close look at all the internals and see what they really changed with this new generation of K1. Now I had a Creality spokesperson come by my office just recently and I actually cleaned up my office, which is, uh, you know, it's kind of a shocking thing when that happens. It actually looks pretty nice around here. But he asked why I have this 35 pound weight. And it's so that I can do unboxings of 35 pound printers one handed, just like that. Uh, okay, the shipping weight of this thing is 14.5 kilograms. That's inside of the box. Let's get some of these foam blocks out of here. And let's start to look for some of the differences on this machine. Uh, power cable, a couple pieces of door hardware, just a really tiny activated carbon filter. I don't think it's gonna do a whole lot to reduce the smell of this machine, but any little bit helps, so let's get it installed. That just kinda attaches to the back there. Let's take off this tape. Here's our little screen. Let's just get that attached up front. There's just a tiny box of hardware here. We got some Allen wrenches, some grease, some glue stick. I know a lot of people complained when their printers don't come with glue stick nowadays. So we've got some glue stick here. I over tightened the screw here. And there's no metal inserts. All right, so now I have a 3D printer pen. Okay, so I'm going to repair this by just injecting some PLA into this bolt hole. And then uh, we'll screw in this bolt into that molten PLA. There we go. Okay, so just looking at some of the differences it appears that they've done some minor improvements to manufacturability. On the previous models, these were stickers up here on the top. Now it looks like they did some kind of masking. Let's actually pull up the other Creality K1 that I have. All right, so looking at these side by side, I don't really see a whole lot of differences between the two. Now apparently there's some internal differences if we look at the hot end, so let's do a close up of that. Now the one thing that they're advertising is they have this unicorn nozzle hot end design. It's supposed to be a little bit lower maintenance and easier to do nozzle changes. So we'll take a look at that. I actually don't see any difference between this and the old Creality K1. I'm not sure what the difference is supposed to be. 99% of the time you're just going to be printing with the standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle on a machine like this. So I really don't see the need to have an easy change nozzle system. However, it does look like these stepper motors have gone back to a more conventional sized pulley here. So on this other design, they went with these really large diameter pulley gears. On this updated design, it looks like they've kind of, you know, went back to the old size, which is like roughly 20 teeth per revolution. The larger pulley gears over here are more like 40 teeth per revolution on the older K1. So the newer K1 going with those smaller pulley gears, hopefully that makes a good difference in print quality. But everything else looks almost exactly the same. This extruder latching mechanism feels a heck of a lot better than the old model that I had. I know when Creality first came out with the K1 they were having some under extrusion issues due to this extruder latching mechanism. But this one is extremely assured in which setting it's set to. It's like 10 times as clicky as a light switch. You know, like these little light switches over here. This thing is extremely clicky, very satisfying. So that's definitely, I mean, I really hope that solves any type of extruder issues that you might have with this machine. This seems like it's gonna be very reliable. I just have to remove three silver screws in here and then the machine should be ready to go. We've got a one-sided kind of engineering type plate here and it's got a little rubber which is just kind of like shoe sole rubber material almost. And I guess that's for wiping the nozzle onto. 
It's got a magnetic build plate, just like, um, I don't know, everything else. The only new thing that I can see here is they've changed the branding up front. Right here, you've got this nice lettering that says the build volume and the K1C designation. And this hinge is a lot sturdier than the old hinge. I think some uh, YouTubers had some issues with the hinge door flinging open and shattering, so they've put some nice, strong, detenting uh, door hinges in here. So that's nice to see that Creality took that little piece of feedback seriously. Altogether, it seems to be really well built. It looks like the filament runout detection system is the same, and the cable system on top is similar but slightly different. If you look on the original K1, the cable chain is flush mounted to the top of the hot end. On this K1C, it looks like they've spaced it up about one centimeter so that you don't have issues with this cable chain rubbing on things. I know that was a common complaint that people had. Also, when accessing the full range of motion, we had issues with the cable chain kind of getting caught on this corner back here, um, which it didn't cause any print issues in my experience, but it did give it kind of a cheap sounding rattly feel when that's kind of bumping around. But over here, you can see it clears the top of the printer, so it's not gonna bump into anything. If you do have this lid in place, let's take a look. If you have this lid in place and the printer is moving around, then it will rub against the edges a little bit, but it shouldn't really cause any issues. Yeah, it seems to be really free running in there, so um, that seems to be another issue that they wanted to fix on this new model of the K1, and it looks like they've addressed it. Also, this cable chain being up a little higher means that you can have a more gradual curve for that Bowden tube going into the extruder. So it won't be so much of a pinch point there as it's trying to round that tight bend. There's no major design changes here, but it looks like they're fixing a lot of little things with this new K1C. All right, let's turn this thing on and see what happens. Okay, that took about 20 seconds to turn on. And that usually happens when I have the wrong power setting on the power supply. Right now it's set to 230 volts. Let's flip that over to 115. There we go, it boots up a lot faster. And the power supply and motherboard fan, I'm not sure which one, is turned on as I flip that switch. It's really not that loud, but it's louder than absolutely silent. So I would like to have that quieted down a little bit. It's uh, right at that threshold of not being annoying enough for me to feel like actually changing it. So let's go through the setup here. Uh, you have to agree to this privacy policy. I don't really like these privacy policies and cloud services. But if you never hook this thing up to the internet, then you shouldn't really have to worry about it. You can connect this to your Wi-Fi. We've got a nice full keyboard here. All right, touch screen is nice and responsive, so it was really easy to enter my password there. You can skip that step if you don't want to hook it up to any network and just run it off of this USB port as well. So you've got really nice connectivity options using this USB type A port. Now it's going to run its self-check, so I guess we just hit start detecting and it's going to do its own startup procedure and calibration and all that kind of thing. So let's just uh, let it do its thing. Now, according to the information I've received from Creality, this K1C is supposed to be a K1 kind of carbon edition that's capable of printing with kind of carbon reinforced materials. So it's kind of the equivalent of the X1C, you know, that Bamboo Lab X1C flagship product. K1C instead of X1C, you can see where they're going with that. So I'll be testing out some carbon filled materials just to see how this machine handles it. They're probably using a copper nozzle with a steel insert at the tip so that it can handle those abrasive materials a little bit better. We'll be trying out a couple different materials. Um, one other thing that I just realized is there's a webcam over here in the corner. So overall, this is just a refreshed version of the K1. If you already have a K1, I'm not sure it would be worth upgrading to this machine since it's gonna be roughly the same. However, it looks like they've fixed a lot of the small issues that you had with the K1 on this K1C. So this cable chain routing's a little bit better. The uh, extruder appears to be of much higher quality. 
And those changes might actually be incorporated onto the regular K1. So right now we're doing the input shaper and you can hear this thing is shaking around quite a bit. One thing I really like about this machine so far is how fast and responsive the touch screen is. So when I push buttons on here, it's like immediate and using that keyboard is nice and easy. Okay, and we've still got the same massive turbo powered fans on these machines. So they are a little bit loud. That's one common complaint with the K1 series is how loud they are. And that really just comes down to the massive amount of part cooling they've included on these machines. I think it might be worth installing some kind of speed limiter, either through firmware or hardware, where you can reduce the overall maximum speed of that part cooling fan on the side here. Just because, I mean, it's a bit much. I, I mean, more power is more better, but after a certain point, it's just more noise. So now it's doing its automatic bed leveling thing. This is pretty common for printers nowadays, but if you haven't seen it before, let's just take a look. So I guess self-check complete. So let's see how fast this puppy can go. Ooh, there's a little rubber gasket here too, which I assume is to get a better seal when you close this door. There's still a gap down here at the bottom, but I've seen some aftermarket mods where people print out a little piece that just kind of covers up this area. So this should be a much better machine in terms of like trying to get an enclosed sealed space. Since we're hooked up to the network, I might as well see what this webcam feed looks like and uh, we'll slice and upload a couple parts. I could slice a Benchy, but I feel like that's kind of boring. Let's go with something else. Delete. Ah, right click, delete. Yes. This is a project that I'm working on. I'm gonna print out a 50% scale prototype just to see what it looks like. Meanwhile, we've got our print getting started over here on the K1. All right, I'm gonna stop this test with the Prusament just because I'm not sure if this is a filament that's optimized for high flow printing. We can see some kind of issues here. It looks kind of perforated. Let's switch over to some Creality's Hyper Series filament, which is supposed to be designed for their machines and for this high speed printing capability, which you definitely need when you're pushing these really high printing speeds. You're just moving so much filament that it needs to flow well. These little models I had printed out on my, my K1 originally, and they had little issues with VFAs. So I'm gonna see if that's been addressed in this new version of the K1. All right, this test print is coming out a lot better. I assume what was happening on the previous run was uh, we were basically using a filament that wasn't optimized for high flow printing. So it just couldn't keep up with the extrusion demands of this high-speed print. But now that we've got the Hyper PLA in here, which is similar to a lot of other manufacturers that are producing their high-flow series of filament, um, this is looking a lot better. So let's go ahead and stop this to do the most valuable testing. Once you see and can assess whether the thing is working or not, you stop and move on to the next thing, otherwise you're over-testing. Okay, let's go ahead and start the Benchy, and uh, it says it should be done in 16 minutes. Also, let's take a look here at this high-speed 600 millimeters per second test print. I was thinking that maybe since they reduced the gearing ratio uh, due to the pulleys being a different diameter in the back of the machine there, since they're using smaller pulleys now, you might think that they'd be losing out some of the high-end speed that the old machine was capable of. But nope, those stepper motors just spin faster to make up for the difference. And it's still able to achieve these um, 600 millimeters per second print speeds. In terms of the print quality here, I can't see any layer lines. Seems to be very consistent and clean prints. But that's what we come to expect out of printers nowadays. They just have to work. So, I mean, so far this thing's been working pretty well. Let's see how the Benchy turns out. And then we'll do some practical prints just to evaluate this machine further. All 
All right, so another test model that I've loaded up here is a bunch of these little bearing, these little rollers that go inside of a 3D printed bearing that I was messing around with previously. Um, this does a really good job of drawing out the VFAs that were present on the previous K1 model. So I'm really curious to see how this print turns out. Also, I printed out this tie thing. Uh, it's like a print in place mechanism and you break it loose and it's like a chain mail kind of thing. It's a pretty cool print and it's got my channel logo on there. So it's just a fun thing to wear if I go to events. This will be a really challenging print. Lots of retractions, lots of moving around and printing small objects. So this will be a really good stress test. Let's go ahead and slice this. And while this benchy is going, let's go ahead and take a look at the printer UI. So here's the laptop view. You can see it's got a pretty high resolution camera here. Looks like it's at least 1080p. And unlike the crap you get on some other printer manufacturers, you actually get a really good frame rate here. This looks like 15 or so frames per second. Really nothing to be too upset about. Image quality looks nice and good. It's also in a relatively useful spot there. We'll see if I can actually change the angle of the camera a little bit. Yeah. Well, it would be nice for the camera to be pointing to the left a little bit, just to kind of center the frame. But this is good enough. Uh, maybe I can work on that after the printer has stopped moving. But anyways, you can see all this useful information here. This is like a, a clipper-like interface. I guess it's called Fluid. Let's see, we've got Exclude Object. That's awesome. Oh man, and this bed mesh is not looking so flat. I don't know, is that really that bad? Let's see. Looks like we've got plus half a millimeter up here, and then uh, minus 0.3 millimeters down there. I mean, that's the nice thing about automatic bed leveling is that it compensates for these kind of, you know, skewed beds automatically. I'm not sure if that's even enough skew to be visibly, you might not even be able to see that just by looking at it. I'm looking at the bed right now and I can't exactly tell which edge is lower. So I think I can fix that by um, rotating one of those screws relative to the others. But yeah, exclude object is a really cool feature. So let's say I'm printing 20 items like, uh, I don't know, like this. And let's say this cluster of little items starts failing. Well, with exclude items, I can actually just click the one that's not working well anymore. And then it'll delete that out of the current build and it'll continue printing the rest of these. I think that's a really good feature to have if you're running a really large print job and something fails. You don't wanna to have to waste that entire tray of half printed parts. You can just cancel the one that's not working anymore and proceed that way. Let's see, we've got these fans. I guess we can control them here. Let's see, if I turn that side fan off, does that quiet things down a bit? Yeah, it does. Model fan, let's turn that one off too. Oh yeah, that's a lot quieter, but we have to keep these turned on. Otherwise, I think we're gonna have issues with the print quality on this Benchy. It doesn't show all of the information. Like, uh, for instance, we don't have volumetric flow rate showing up on this graph. We have the current X and Y coordinate. You can see the Z has to change quite a bit to compensate for that bed not being perfectly flat. But overall, it looks like things are working out pretty well. So we're gonna finish printing this Benchy pretty soon. It looks like we're gonna be right on schedule, right around 16 minutes. All right, while this print is running, I think now is as good a time as any to do a decibel test. So this is kind of a worst case scenario. We've got the top and front open with all the fans running full blast. So let's just see how loud it is in the worst case. As is customary, I do this from one arm's length away. Let's see what we've got. So right about 62 decibels. That's incredibly loud. Let's go ahead and shut the top. Looks like right around 53 decibels. So immediately you're getting like a 10 decibel reduction just by closing this thing off a little bit. I think 
actually, you've got an appreciable amount of noise coming out of this small gap here. So let's just say we're able to plug that up. All right, so just by plugging up this little gap in the bottom, we'll do one more measurement, arm's length away. Okay, so still right around 53 decibels, so not really a noticeable difference from that small gap being there. All around this kind of top perimeter, I guess there's a hole back here as well. There's, there's little bits of uh, sound being able to escape out of all of this because this isn't foam lined up here. This is just hard plastic against metal. There's no foam in there kind of filling the gap and preventing the, the noise from spilling out, which I think on the K1 Max and some of the other printers kind of in this price range, they actually put foam gaskets around all of these kind of ceiling points, which really helps hold the noise in quite a bit. I mean, it's just a little bit of material here and there, but it ends up making quite a big difference. So maybe that's a mod that I could do on here, put a little bit of, uh, you know, extra material just to seal up these last little bits and areas where sound can escape. But overall, I mean, 53 decibels, that's not too bad. It's well within, you know, the limits of other printers in this speed and price category. I mean, that fan is incredibly loud, but it's doing an important job at making sure this benchy doesn't look like crap. So, yeah. Okay, and then when the print is done, it turns this side fan on and this part cooling fan on all the way to try and cool down the hot end as fast as possible. Let's just turn all that off. Now, all we have is kind of the fans inside the bottom of the machine. So that's the motherboard fan and the power supply fan. We'll see how loud it is at idle here. So arm's length away. So about 44 decibels. Now, that's to say that silent operation isn't one of this machine's strong suits. What it's good at is, I mean, what you see here, printing things as fast as possible and having decent print quality while it's doing it. So let's take a look at this. I mean, we can do some close-ups of this later, but this is extremely good print quality for a 16-minute benchy. Definitely nothing to complain about here. I mean, this is a darn near perfect benchy at those speeds. I don't see any ringing. That's just very good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get some of these other prints started. I loaded them up onto this flash drive. I can import print jobs through this web interface. So all I have to do is go to the IP address. If we go to our network settings, uh, it'll have the printer's IP address listed there. You just enter that into your web browser and then that pulls up this interface screen. And you can start and stop print jobs from here. You can check the history. Basically, a lot of the same options that you get here, you also get on this web interface. So that's really nice to be able to start up your print jobs that way. And you can even upload files here. Um, See, I can click this import button and then that'll open up my files and I can import whatever pieces of G-code I want onto this machine. Creality Print does have a great uh, multiple device management tab here. So if you have like 20 printers, you'll be able to load them all up in this tab. However, since this is a pre-release model, um, I, I'm guessing that the support for this printer isn't built into the slicer just yet at this moment, but I would expect it to be when this printer actually launches. So once that's working, you'll have all your printers loaded up. You can queue up jobs to them and check the status of all your printers quite easily that way. But for now, I'm just using the USB drive, or if I wanted to, I could also uh, upload files this way using this little import button. Um, also, I can check my webcam here, so lots of cool functionality. But let's go ahead and get some more print jobs started. So I can plug in my USB drive here. We click the USB drive button, and then we've got all of our print jobs loaded up right here. It looks like I forgot to uh, load that last job onto the USB drive, so actually I'll use this import functionality. I'll just go to that piece of G-code. We'll open that up and that'll upload the G-code onto the machine using this web interface. So nice and convenient there. We're already 50% the way done, so it's a nice and fast data transfer there. And once that's uploaded, I can see it here. So now that print job is showing up at the bottom there. 
Also, if I look on my local files here, I can see that print job loaded up right here. And it even has a nice preview of the print model. So I think that might be a feature that you only get by using Creality Print. Uh, they might have that kind of functionality using Orca Slicer, but I don't use Orca Slicer all that much. If you go into Orca Slicer, you will have a bunch of print profiles baked in for this K1. So if you want to use a different slicer, you can always use Orca Slicer and then upload your jobs wirelessly using this online workflow. Or just put them on a flash drive and toss them over onto the machine. According to Creality, this print job is going to be almost three hours. So let's just flip this over into time lapse mode. I'll come back to either a giant bowl of spaghetti or hopefully some nicely finished parts. All right, so this print job finished up pretty uneventfully. Let's go ahead and peel off the plate. All right, so let's take a look at this. This covered most of the bottom of this print surface and it appears to have excellent first layer quality. So everything seems to be working just fine. Let's go ahead and switch over to this PETG. I want to repeat my tests where I'm printing out some of these small diameter little thingamajigs. And that's really going to show me whether the VFA issue has been fixed on this machine. So let's just switch this out. All right, and before we get started with this next print job, I'm actually going to change print surfaces. This is a print surface from my CR10 SE. So I'll just go ahead and pull this one off. And put this in it in its place and it looks like it fits just fine in here. I personally prefer the way PETG sticks to this PEI sheet material so that's why I want to use it. Now I uploaded some models into this machine from Orca Slicer and the Orca Slicer previews aren't loading correctly. I'm pretty sure there's some way to get this working correctly but I wasn't able to figure it out. It's not loading any of the, uh, the metadata about this print but it does have the bed and print temperature as well as the time prediction in the title of the part itself. I'm going to go ahead and skip the calibration. Oh wait, no. I probably want to do the calibration because this is a new bed sheet. So this will be a PETG test print and it'll have the dual purpose of verifying that the VFAs are truly dead and gone on this K1. And again, the reason why I'm doing so much investigation about the VFAs on this machine is because on the older K1, I was having issues with that. So let's take a look here. The main difference is, I think this pulley gear in the back, it's much smaller in diameter. It's like a 20 tooth pulley. If we take a look over at the old K1, as well as the K1 Max, I believe, you can see they decided to go with some wacky stuff here. You can see that pulley gear is much larger and I guess they were going for absolute highest speed possible by going with those large diameter pulley gears. That's the only reason I can think of why they would do that. They've decided to stick with a more conventional pulley size. And I'm hoping that helps fix a lot of the issues that we were having with VFAs. And what are VFAs? Well, let me just do some close-ups here. These were some of the troubled parts that came off of my old K1. And you can see that texture on these parts. It looks like about every millimeter is a bit of a bump there. I'm not sure exactly what was causing it, but on larger parts it wasn't really apparent that that was an issue, but it was only on like really small objects like that where I would see those VFAs showing up. So, you know, I've designed a special print job just to investigate and see if it's still an issue. 
So we'll see how that turns out. In terms of this plate, everything looks pretty good. There is a little bit of surface roughness on the edges. Everything's nice and smooth. This nice satin glossy finish that you get on the bottom with the provided build tray is pretty nice. So let's get this PETG printing and then next up we'll run some carbon fiber nylon parts because I think that's what the C stands for, this K1C. It might stand for carbon fiber printability. So we'll investigate. Anyways, I'm gonna switch this over to time-lapse mode just because watching, I don't know, three hour prints one at a time is not the most entertaining way to spend your day. So let's just uh, speed it up a little bit. Okay, so I just had a print failure on this thing. Basically, the bend radius for that PTFE tube was too sharp, so the filament broke inside of the tube. I mean, that's a common problem if you're dealing with stiff carbon fiber reinforced filaments. But it's something that on a printer that's designed to print carbon fiber filaments should be sorted out. Anyway, so that broke, and then as the printer just kind of sat not printing for a while, it was continuing to run. I guess there's some heat creep that worked its way up into this heat break. So when I try to feed some filament in here, you can see it doesn't want to go very far in. It stops about there, which is all the way up here, it appears we have a clog. So what I'm going to try and do is heat this whole thing up, blast it with some heat and force that through, and hopefully we can do a cold pull and remove any residual plastic in here. This is one of the downsides of having this proprietary type nozzle. It's a easy nozzle change, but I don't have a spare nozzle on hand right now. And uh, you know, I can't just throw some random nozzle from one of my other printers into the machine. So I'm going to try and clear this clog out. Hopefully I don't damage anything. So I'm just going to heat up this whole section from the hot end all the way up to this heat break area where I suspect the nozzle clog is. So let's just heat it up. Okay, so that's melting this plastic already. But uh, yeah, that's PLA and what's stuck in there is probably that carbon fiber nylon. So that's gonna be really hard to clear out just because I need such a high temperature. So this is gonna be tricky. Let's heat it up some more. I think I'm actually going to use this metal tool that Creality provides. There we go.
right, so now I'm gonna take this hot end apart. I mean, I probably failed at trying to clean this nozzle out. I think I burnt out a lot of the filament and it kind of turned to dust. But um, overheating this nozzle could be a bad thing. It looks like this is a threaded piece on the tip. So I'm gonna see if I can unthread it. So I can't tell if this is a press fit or some sort of screwed together construction. I tried taking it apart, but it didn't work very well. So we're just gonna leave it alone. And Creality is sending me a replacement nozzle. However, I think what I'm gonna do here is see if I can install this Micro Swiss Flowtech hot end. So Micro Swiss sent me one of these to check out. So uh, I guess I'll see if it fits on this machine. And it comes with its own hot end that looks like it'll be a little bit more sturdy just because of this metal construction and they've covered up that ceramic heater with a little metal shield, which is a nice touch. And it allows one-handed nozzle changes, pretty similar to what Creality has provided. There's a couple small differences I'm noticing though, and the main one is this diameter is different. So on the Flowtech hot end, you have to install this little copper sleeve thing. Then every time you thread a nozzle into here, uh, it threads in and, you know, this butts up inside of this little copper heat transferring device that helps you bridge the gap between the heat break and the installed heat sink inside of the K1. I have a feeling this isn't gonna fit in the stock configuration, so I might have to do some modifications here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take this apart, and I'll be giving my feedback to Micro Swiss, so hopefully they can adapt this Flowtech hot end to work on this new K1C. One kind of annoying thing about this K1 is there's no way to move the table downwards. Oh, wait, if I push on it, it'll move. So never mind, you just gotta push on it with a little bit more force. Make sure you're pushing kind of in the middle of the bed. And that should drive the table down. Okay, so what I wanna do here is I actually wanna remove the entire uh, heat sink inside of here, just so we can take a look at it. I know the previous iteration of the heat sink had some issues, in my opinion. Some little design improvements could be made to it. Also, this PCB seems like it's a little bit wobbly and loose. These screws feel like they were inserted all the way, it's just they weren't completely clamping down on this little uh, breakout board here. Wow, that's interesting. So I'm not sure if you can tell what's going on here, but we've basically got this uh, heat sink, which it looks like they have made some improvements to it. They've actually cut all the way through here, so you can see my finger behind here. Uh, through this heat sink. So the air is passing all the way through. If the air is going all the way through, that's a big improvement to just blowing flat up against this plate and getting trapped. Because with heat sinks, it's important to have air flowing through it. It's not enough to just blow air at it. The air has to go past those fins in order to dissipate heat into the air. In terms of the heat break design, it really doesn't look that efficient. You can see we've got these two spacers and then two screws kind of attach it to this aluminum block. When we insert this nozzle here, this is the stock Creality nozzle, and we thread it in, this kind of just goes up in there, and then, uh, well, the threads are all kind of gunked up because of my experimentations I was doing with the blowtorch. But anyways, this goes in there, and then this copper piece in the middle here actually goes up inside of this aluminum part. And there was a little bit of thermal paste on there, so that helps dissipate the heat into this heat sink. However, the issue here might be this little thing is transferring too much heat up into this aluminum heater block. Let's unscrew that and take a closer look at it. Now let's use tiny screws. Let's just unplug this uh, heater, I'm making sure my power is off before I keep doing this. I don't want to short any of the connectors here and damage the printer. All right, so here's the heat sink, and let's take a closer look at this little assembly we've got here. These are little pieces here that kind of function as spacers. And then the screws go through the middle there and clamp this down. Now, these spacers seem to be very big. They might be kind of too big. So the issue here is, since you're only using two of these spacers, they have to 
support a load in a cantilever mode. So if you look at it from the side, you know, you've just got this, these two fasteners right here, and any bending load like this that the tool head sees, it's going to need to react that with these two little fasteners, which isn't ideal. I mean, really, you want to have three or four of these little spacers arranged in a square or triangular pattern to react any type of load. But with this, since they're in a line, you know, that's a really bad load case, kind of bending to front and back like that. So I guess they had to size them up, but as a consequence, they're now a little bit too big and are transferring probably a significant amount of heat up into that heat sink. So you can see this heat sink here. It's going to have to be dissipating more heat because of these big fat spacers. I think these are some kind of ceramic because they have kind of a, a strange surface finish. I mean, they're not really shiny and they feel a little bit lighter than I feel like something this sh size should be. And I've got my little tool here. I can pick stuff up. And you can see here, oops, these do not react to the, uh, the magnetic field from the screwdriver. So these are probably some kind of ceramic, uh, low thermal conductivity element, but that kind of nozzle clog that I experienced shouldn't happen even when it's clogged overnight and the filament's just sitting in that area for a long period of time. You really shouldn't have issues with nozzle clogging like that. Now another potential reason might be the way they have this fan set up. This fan gets installed here behind this PCB. So the fan's right here, and then the PCB's right in front there. So it's obstructing the intake of the fan a little bit, which might be reducing the airflow that you're getting. But overall, you should be getting a decent amount of air over this heat sink. Let's take um, the Bamboo Lab hot end, for example. You can see it's roughly similar in terms of surface area. I think this Bamboo Lab hot end has maybe twice the surface area and the fan is positioned in a, uh, in a way that it blows more air through those vent holes. So this might be maybe twice as efficient. Plus you don't have the heat load from the additional supports that they've added on the Creality hot end. On this Bamboo Lab hot end, it's just the typical design where you've just got that one small heat break that's carrying all the load. Regardless, uh, I had an issue that I feel like I shouldn't have had on this machine. So, yeah. Now when it comes to installing this Flowtech hot end, I don't think it's gonna work very well because, um, well, this copper piece is too large to fit in here. Also, if you take a look at this area above the heat break, you can see you've got this really long uh, extended portion of the heat break that goes up into the machine. So that kind of guides the filament way up here down into the heat break. And if I were to just install this Flowtech hot end, I'm not sure it would work. It'll need to have this tube. So just make this titanium piece, you know, quite a bit longer. I think this is something that Micro Swiss could do. Uh, okay, so all that's to say, I didn't have a very good experience trying to print carbon fiber with this machine. However, the PETG and PLA prints that I was running seemed to work just fine. It's just, you know, what does the C stand for? Does the C mean carbon fiber or something? Or does it just mean slightly improved K1? To me, it doesn't seem like this machine is really ready to do carbon fiber printing, mainly because of the issues that I had. So, you know, that clogged hot end. Also, this Bowden tube up top has too sharp of a bend radius, and you can see that carbon fiber filament inside of there. It snapped as it was going around that bend radius. So, you know, this really isn't a machine that's ready to do carbon fiber printing, in my opinion, but it is a very good printer in other ways, like if you're just printing regular materials. So, I think there's a bit of a branding issue. This really isn't a K1C in my opinion. This is just a K12. That's kind of, you know, got some nice design improvements in there. You've got the easier nozzle changes. You've got the uh, slightly improved heat sink here with those vent holes that go around back. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of nice little improvements on here, but it's just not a carbon fiber filament. 
printing machine, in my humble opinion. Now, they have on here listed uh, generic PLA carbon, so maybe this would have worked with Creality's PLA carbon fiber filament. I actually have some of it here, so I'll be trying this out at a later time when I get this hot end replaced. But overall, you know, what's the deal with this machine? All right, well, time to share my final thoughts on the Bamboo Lab K1C, Creality K1C, and how it compares to the old Creality K1. So there's a bunch of minor improvements here. I'll just go over all of them now for clarity. The first one is the cable chain. So instead of having just a flat cable chain that runs along the top plane of this printer, they've elevated it a little bit with the spacer, and I think that makes it run a lot smoother. Especially when the lid is off, the cable chain behaves really well and it just goes to this outer area when it's moving. Um, so that's a nice little improvement. Also, the heat sink inside of here is improved. They added some slots that cut all the way through the aluminum heat sink, so that allows more air to pass through there and allows them to dissipate more heat. Also, they changed the belt pulleys in the back, so now they're using a more standard, smaller sized belt pulley, which probably sacrifices a little bit of the top end speed, but it ends up being more optimal for regular printing. And I think that also allowed them to use smaller stepper motors because the amount of force you can exert on a belt, like pulling and pushing it, using a pulley and motor is proportional to the diameter of that pulley. So if you use a smaller diameter pulley, you can get more force out of those motors. So that has essentially allowed them to spec a smaller motor. If you look on this K1, it's got some absolutely massive stepper motors. And on this K1C, the stepper motors are just a little bit bigger than average, but they're not the huge jumbo uh, stepper motors that you've got on the K1. Also, the extruder issues seem to be all sorted out. That was kind of an issue that plagued the original K1. They, uh, the little flipper switch up here was basically having issues where it wasn't firmly clicking into the engaged position. Um, but now on these newer extruders, that's no longer an issue. Um, on both of these printers that I have right now, these extruders are very tight and you're not going to have the same under extrusion issues that were common with the very early model K1s. So whether you get the K1 or the K1C, your extruder's probably gonna be fine. They've really sorted out those issues. And uh, yeah, they just, you know, they seem to work a lot more reliably now. Also, this K1C comes with a nozzle with a hardened steel tip, so you can print abrasive materials right out of the box. Um, I guess Creality is trying to push their new uh, Hyper PLA with carbon fiber added which basically should be like a normal PLA, but have increased stiffness. So that could be something that's worth printing on this machine. I tested out carbon fiber nylon because that's really the main reason you'd want to switch over to using a carbon fiber reinforced material, in my opinion, um, because you're getting that increased strength as well as the toughness of nylon. If you print other materials using carbon fiber reinforced filaments, they'll be very brittle and easy to snap. Nylon has such a high base toughness that it's able to handle that carbon reinforcement really well and produce like extreme mechanical properties. PLA is kind of stiff enough already. If you were to print out a PLA part and a nylon part, the nylon is actually quite flexible. Um, so when you add carbon fiber, it stiffens it up and kind of makes an improved material. Versus PLA, it's already stiff enough. It's really easy to print at low temperatures. You can print it on really cheap machines. I don't think that's a really good example of a carbon fiber reinforced material. I think, uh, you know, carbon fiber nylon is really what should be the gold standard for carbon fiber reinforced uh, materials and printers. And any material that's capable of printing carbon fiber reinforced materials or advertised as such should be able to handle carbon fiber nylon because uh, personally I think that's the main reason you'd want to print with a carbon fiber reinforcement. Also, this K1C comes with a camera pre-installed, so you can monitor your prints and watch everything that's happening. But largely, these two machines are pretty much the same. All those differences that I mentioned really aren't game changers in any way. On my K1, which I destroyed by doing really stupid things with it, I didn't notice any major differences in the print quality or speed. The main issue that I had with this K1 was just the extruder not working, and since the newer models are shipping with improved extruders, that's no longer really an issue. So, I mean, the K1's still a great printer. The K1C has some improvements, and I do think those improvements 
uh, make for a better user experience, but there's some downsides to it. Mainly, they're switched to a proprietary nozzle system like this. It means that you can't just buy any random nozzle and install it into this machine. Now, they might be able to make some kind of adapter that's like, you know, basically this assembly but with the tip cut off and then you can thread in a V6 style standard nozzle and uh, you know they could do something like that I think Prusa did that with their system that's remarkably similar to this but yeah it still has some of the same issues with serviceability these machines are very well constructed but let's say in the future a bearing goes out or something you're gonna have a really hard time replacing it compared to the old Ender 3 style machines you know, you can replace basically any part on those in a matter of minutes versus this would require you to disassemble the frame and do some weird stuff to get these rods out or, you know, replace these bearing blocks on the sides. A lot of the components on this Core XY stage are glued into position or press fit into position. So it's really not a user serviceable design. I really like what they did with the cable chain here that fixes like all the issues that I was having. However, when you have the lid on here, it's still going to kind of collide with it a little bit and might cause some issues. Um, but really, you can avoid that if you have the lid installed. You can avoid those issues by not printing in that back left corner there. I think one kind of problem that this design has in general is this cable management, especially when it goes to this back corner. See, so you have this overlap, it's like hanging off the back of the printer here, which this lid has a hard time containing. So the real issue here is that they decided to taper in up at the top. If they would have just kept a square profile all the way around, there would probably be enough room for this belt uh, and this cable chain to be just hanging out over here in the back. But since they decided to taper it in a little bit, you run out of space and you, you kind of run into issues there. So that's something that would require a slight redesign to just like kind of have this top edge just be straight. I still like the print surface that this machine comes with. I like the speeds that you can achieve. Um, I solved the VFA issue. I know a lot of people complained about that, but basically the trick with that is to just turn the speeds down. So I was running uh, a print and then halfway through, I turned the speed down to 25% and then the outer layers were much, much cleaner after you know, reducing the speed. Slow it down when you have features that have uh, important surface finish requirements, and it just gets rid of all the VFAs and replaces it with just nice, smooth extrusion. Overall, both of these machines are really well built and they're offering really great value. It's just, uh, you know, with this K1C, I think they're advertising it as a carbon capable printer, but since it was having trouble with this carbon fiber nylon that I was trying to print with it, I wouldn't call it as such. Um, really, it's just a slightly improved K1 with some, you know, some decent design improvements. However, the one thing I don't like is their use of this proprietary nozzle system uh, because it's really put this review on hold because, you know, when I had a clog in this nozzle that I couldn't resolve, I couldn't just pop it out and clear the nozzle because you know, you can't just push the jam through. If you push really hard, you have to do it with the nozzle heated up really hot, as well as the section where the clog is occurring, heated up, and then you just gotta like brute force it through and try and squish that out of there. Um, and that's hard to do, so obviously I was having issues with it. Versus on the regular K1, you can just unscrew the nozzle uh, take out the heat break, maybe replace the heat break if you need to. It's a relatively standard part. I think I have one over here. You know, this heat break is pretty similar to what we see on other printers. I'm pretty sure you could get something that's designed for like an Ender 3 or similar printer and just pop it in there and it would work. And then it can fit standard volcano style nozzles on this K1 hot end. Versus this one, you have to use their proprietary nozzle system and I haven't seen the pricing or whatever on these. I'm sure it's reasonable. Creality doesn't really tend to gouge you on pricing. On Creality stuff, usually upgrades cost between 10 and $20. So maybe this would cost maybe $25 since it's got all these extra pieces in it, maybe $30. And that's kind of the issue with these proprietary nozzle systems. Instead of being able to take advantage of existing supply chains and open source designs that everybody uses, you're kind of locked into just getting nozzles from Creality until the third party manufacturers end up uh, spinning up production. But, you know, in 10 years, I bet people are still going to be 
producing volcano nozzles, but I don't know if they're going to be producing these proprietary nozzles from all these different uh, 3D printer manufacturers. Since volcano nozzles have hit this kind of critical mass and so many people use them, you've basically ensured that there's going to be a supply chain basically indefinitely for these products, well, at least as long as you'll live until we can start 3D printing nozzles, which, uh, believe it or not, is a thing. I mean, this is a case of two steps forward, one step back, in my opinion. There's a lot of really great improvements on this machine, and a lot of them have actually been folded back into their regular K1. Uh, something I'm noticing here is this hot end is a lot tighter on this new K1. I wonder if they worked on their tolerances for their bearings and stuff, but it seems like this is a lot sturdier. This one kind of rocks back and forth just a little bit. But, you know, this is just, they're improving the design, they're working on it. Uh, I just wish they would consult me, you know, personally. Just give me a call and be like, hey, uh, what do you think of this design we're working on? And I could be like, uh, no, do something different. Um, so at the end of the day, both of these machines are pretty similar. If you can find a K1 on sale and it's $100 cheaper than a K1C, I'd probably still opt for the K1 just because, you know, it's not that big of a difference. I mean, this one has the camera monitoring and stuff. I guess that's important for some people. For me personally, well, I guess I could have used it in this case and saw that broken down print and stopped it early uh, instead of letting it run for a while and jam itself up. Uh, but at the end of the day, both of these offer the same thing. They're both really high speed printers, um, really good print quality at high speeds. You've got a great user interface. You've got, you know, USB workflow capabilities. You've got uh, great LAN capabilities. So just by logging into your Wi-Fi, you can check a bunch of stuff on these printers. And the other great thing about these is you can root them. So you can put your own version of Clipper on here and basically reprogram and mod these if you feel like doing that. So yeah, that's about all I have to say about this machine. We'll get it back up and running when I get one of the new proprietary nozzles from Creality and just screw that in and put this all back together. If you want to pick one of these up, check the affiliate link in the description down below. Um, I think it's a good printer overall. I probably wouldn't print uh, carbon fiber reinforced filaments in there unless they're significantly more flexible than this kind of stuff that I was printing with. Uh, carbon fiber filament tends to be pretty stiff, so if you have, uh, you know, a more flexible type of carbon fiber reinforced filament, then this nozzle can handle it, and it can handle the abrasiveness of the carbon fiber. Also, I've done kind of a hack to be able to uh, use all the Bamboo Lab material profiles on this K1C in Orca Slicer, so I'll leave a link to that as well. I'm uploading that to my Patreon. It's basically a profile that you import in the Orca Slicer and it allows you to use the K1 with all the material presets from the Bamboo Lab printers. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next episode. Um, cool printers.